Uh, I'm John Quelch, the Dean of the University of Miami Patty and Allen Herbert Business School, and welcome to another uh, Southern Glazers Distinguished uh, Leader event. Uh, tonight, our special guest is uh, Dr. William Hasseltine, and uh, we're going to hand over to him shortly. Uh, but uh, to introduce Dr. Hasseltine, uh, we're privileged this evening to have uh, our president, Dr. Julio Frank. Uh, who's a good friend of uh, Williams. And so I'm going to hand over immediately to uh, President Frank for the uh, introduction of our distinguished guest. President Frank. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. I am truly delighted uh, to join uh, in for what I'm, 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 I'm sure it's going to be a very insightful lecture. And, uh, you know, although we cannot be together in person right now, I am very glad to see that the Miami Herbert Business School continues to convene these necessary conversations around important issues. It is, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker who, as you just heard, I have had the privilege of knowing for many years, uh, dating back to my time at, at Harvard University. If I had to describe B Bill Hasseltine in one word, the word that comes to mind is multifaceted. He is a renowned HIV AIDS and cancer researcher, and he's also an innovator, an investor, and a writer. He's a gifted scientist, and his interests have evolved from the micro level of ground, uh, ground working, groundbreaking work in HIV AIDS and the human genome to the macro level of complex health systems. In recent months, uh, as the world has grappled with the COVID-19 pandemic, he has become a prolific commentator who, who really offers clear-headed analysis in the uncertainty of the pandemic. Whenever I get his emails um, with, with some of his latest contributions, I immediately devour them because I have found them to be some of the clearest thinking uh, to make sense of this very complex challenge we are all facing. And I immediately forwarded it to all my friends and contacts. Uh, Bill really understands, like few others, the complexities of the challenges before us, and, and we're really fortunate to have him with us this uh, afternoon. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bill Hasseltine to the University of Miami in this virtual forum. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Frank. And uh, jo joining me on the uh, fireside chat uh, this evening is uh, one of our distinguished faculty members, uh, Professor Caroline Mortensen, uh, who is uh, a professor in our Department of Health Management and Policy and uh, also co-director of our Center on Health Management and Policy. And uh, Caroline uh, will be uh, alternating with me in terms of uh, fireside chat questions to, uh, to Bill. Um, I'm gonna start for a couple of minutes uh, uh, talking about things other than the immediate uh, coronavirus. Um, Bill, you, you are uh, the founder and president of Access Health International. Uh, before uh, the coronavirus, I think that's how you would have been primarily introduced. What, what is Access Health? Why did you found it? And how are you measuring its success? Uh, Access Health is a not-for-profit think tank uh, consulting group. Our mission is to make sure everyone, no matter where they live, no matter what their age, has access to high-quality, affordable health. I came to this uh, after a career both as a scientist and a uh, businessman, where I came to realize that no matter what science can create and understand, no matter what products businesses uh, can produce, if health systems aren't designed properly, aren't funded properly, it really is all for naught because in the end, it's about delivery of health services and the products that the industry makes to people in a way that makes a difference to their life. Uh, I also came to it with the understanding as a scientist, deeply interested in aware of the enormous progress that's being made, that unless people see the tangible benefits in their life of these scientific advances, they're unlikely to keep funding it at the level that they are. And 
the problems in the United States are really acute. Our healthcare costs are very high. Our quality is pretty poor compared to the amount of money we spend. And even on a international scale, we in the United States have health outcomes that are well below the OECD level, almost a standard deviation and a half below. We're ranked number 34 in health outcomes despite, despite all our knowledge and all of our expertise. How long will our American people continue to support the engine that drives the future of everyone's health? And so uh, solving these problems of health equity, we see it acutely in COVID, but not only in COVID. The problems of social determinants of health and what the health system can do to contribute to that other than providing the goods and services that we do are really fundamental questions. We work around the world. Our belief is we don't have all the answers. It's clear, if we had all the answers, we'd be doing better. Uh, there may be a good answers from uh, India, good answers from China, from Japan, from wherever. So we have offices around the world. Mm -hmm. And as we've developed over the last few years, we've been fortunate to have very close relationships with government officials, with people who advise the government. Uh, I'm the chair of the US-China Healthcare Summit. I have just been asked to be an outside uh, advisor to the Indian government to help them fight COVID. But before that, the foundation, Access Health, played a major role in uh, drafting their health reform package that the prime minister had instituted. Those are successes that make me extremely happy because 15 years ago when I created the foundation, that was what I helped to do. Now, curiously, we've had less success in the United States. We're a big country. We have a lot of experts. Uh, a unique voice is hard to find. And uh, I wish we had made more progress here, but I think at least with COVID, we have a chance uh, mm -hmm. to uh, make a uh, unique contribution to Bill, the way we're dealing with this problem. So, Bill, thank you. Bill could, I, could I ask you to, to also comment a little bit on your uh, business uh, initiatives and uh, perhaps one or two of the companies that, that did exceptionally well and you mentioned that the United States has this wonderful uh, scientific engine. Um, why is it that uh, the scientific engine is not uh, dedicating more of its resources towards solving some of these uh, equity issues that you refer to? Well, let me say, first of all, with respect to business, I've been, I've created, and actually I'm still creating a number of uh, companies. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, for my first 10 companies, all the initial investors made a lot of money. That's not to say that all investors, because stocks go up and down and it's their public, but many investors uh, had a healthy return. And we've had eight products approved by the FDA or other agencies uh, that uh, attack such diseases as cancer, lupus, diabetes, uh, and, it, and some infectious diseases. Uh, some drugs for AIDS, uh, ways to protect against bioterrorism with uh, anthrax. It's been, a, it, it been fascinating. I come from a background where my dad was a civil servant and a civil servant as a, as a scientist. And I had no concept of business. But when I really began to learn about medicine, I understood how important business is for translating scientific discoveries to products that people use. And once I made that discovery, uh, I was fortunate to have good friends and be able to create uh, a number of companies. Human Genome Sciences was the biggest and, and most successful. I was the CEO of that company, the founder and CEO of that company for 12 years. We started with 15 million and we sold it for 3.6 billion. Uh, and uh, that was a pretty good return on the original uh, $15 uh, million. But be beyond that, it really changed the paradigm for how you do research. People used to go from phenomenon to gene. Now you go from gene to phenomenon. And it saves about 20 years of uh, research. Actually, one wag uh, called it clone by phone when he was asking for a solution. He called me up. He said, do you have a gene that does this? I said, yep, we do. And within two or three weeks, he had a scientific publication. So we really speeded up the process and, and uh, that's what I uh, wanted to do. Let me take you back to my very first company. The idea 
much more relevant today than people thought it was then, which is to create animal vaccines using new technologies. Uh, we invented a very commonly used uh, adjuvant now called Quill A. I had a Peruvian scientist who knew about a tree that created inflammatory reactions and thought this would be a good thing to use for a, a, an adjuvant. And he and our company created Quill A, which is now a hot commodity in the uh, COVID vaccine uh, market. And so that's been a lot of fun. The first vaccine we created was a peptide vaccine with a new adjuvant for cat leukemia. Uh, and it works and is still used. So, so that, that, that enables me to, uh, as we pivot to uh, our COVID discussion, um, you've spanned three very important uh, pandemics, uh, the polio pandemic, the AIDS pandemic, and now the COVID pandemic. So if we look at the first two of those, what, what lessons were learned that then uh, came to be useful or perhaps are useful today as we face the latest pandemic? Well, you know, for me who was a kid during the tail end of the polio epidemic, what I see around me is very common, is, is very familiar. As a kid, I was told that you can't go to a swimming pool in the summer, you can't be associated with more than three people at the same time. Movie theaters are out, there's polio around. I remember tangible fear. We were afraid. And we didn't know exactly what we were afraid of, but we were afraid and we knew our parents were afraid. And as a kid, it's, it's an indelible impression. And then I remember the very first vaccines. Stick out, you know, first you get a jab and then they give you a sugar cube to swallow. And after that, no more polio. So what are some lessons looking back? Many years later, when I got my very first laboratory at Data Harbor Cancer Institute, I was amazed to discover it was Ender's laboratory where he had isolated the original polio virus. That was my lab. And I decided I was gonna learn a lot about polio. And what I learned really surprised me, that polio is kind of like a cold virus. It's actually an anorak virus, it's waterborne mostly. Uh, but out of every 200 people it infects, one gets paralyzed, and out of every 2,000 people it infects, it kills. That sounds pretty familiar. Uh, and so there's a lot of familiarity in this. There is a difference. There was great confidence that we would get a vaccine knowing what our immune reactions are. Once you're hit with polio, you never get infected again. There's a difference with this disease. There are good experiments to show that if you take a coronavirus and you infect a human being with a cold coronavirus, that you can come back a year later and reinfect them. That means this virus has a different strategy from polio. That immunity for polio is very, very long lasting. Immunity for these viruses is probably not. And as a virologist, when I look deeply into that virus, I see that there are at least 20 tricks we know of now, and we're still counting, that this virus uses to mess with our immune system. This is not just a simple virus that goes in and replicates. It's really big. It's three times bigger than the AIDS virus. What is it doing with all those extra parts? It's subtly altering us, so it can come back again and again and again, like the colds do. And when you have things like that, what we learn from AIDS, when you're dealing with a virus, that has learned to counter our immune defenses, as AIDS does extremely well, we still don't have a vaccine, you have doubts about how easy it is to get a vaccine. Doesn't mean we can't, but it means we have to be very cautious with what we're gonna get when we get one. First of all, of course, safety, it's gotta be safe. But then how effective, you're gonna to have to come back every year? Are you, uh, going to stop all of its manifestations. There's another feature that we have to think about. How does this virus get into us? It gets in through our nasal passages, for the most part. You can swallow dirty water and you'll get it too. But mostly it gets in through our nasal passages. And vaccinologists have had the devil's own time stopping that kind of infection. And there's something else that's very specific. When SARS and MERS came along, we weren't idle. Scientists got their full operation going to make drugs and vaccines. 
And every kind of vaccine you can think of was tried and they all had the same effect. Yes, they raised immunity in the animals. No, they didn't stop nasal infection. None of them. And by the way, that is true of the data we've seen for the SARS vaccines. They may reduce the total amount of virus in the body, but not in the nasal passages. What does that mean for disease? Does it mean we're only gonna get diseases in the nose and maybe the brain because there's a route from the nose to the brain and nowhere else? There's no animal model that we can follow because there's no animal that gets heart disease, uh, kidney disease, blood clots like we do. So we don't really know. Uh, we're waiting to see. So these are sort of some lessons that you learn when you look at a lot of different viruses. Each one has its own strategy. And this one has got its, and its is a tricky one. I'd say it's halfway between polio and HIV in terms of certainty for finding a vaccine that's going to solve our problems. Okay, thank you. Uh, Caroline, over to you. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Hasseltine, to have a conversation about COVID. Uh, we're really pleased that you're joining us. I just want to set the context. So new numbers came out today, 8,500 new cases in Florida just this week. Uh, Miami-Dade County, where University of Miami is, 20,000 cases and uh, up to 784 deaths. But we're reopening our economies, um, you know, full steam ahead. You have a new book out, A Family Guide for COVID-19. What is your advice for consumer health and consumer behavior? So you had some news about a vaccine that didn't sound promising. What do we do in the meantime? Uh, you know, there is a Swedish uh, thinker who's written a very interesting essay. I'm about to share it with my uh, group. It's called The Hammer and the Dance and Where Are We in Sweden? What he means by the hammer and the dance is you do what China does and shut things down really tight. You let that go and then you're free to behave more freely as long as you're careful versus what Sweden has done, which has said, okay, we'll do partial measures. We'll ask people to behave. We'll close colleges and not have big openings, big meetings, but we won't be too strict. We'll let businesses go along. Well, the consequence has been disastrous for Sweden. They have more deaths per capita than anybody by far in Scandinavia and even Europe. They've had a disaster and now they realize it. They realize they made a huge mistake. What was the mistake? It wasn't to close up tight like their neighbors did. It was to close partially. It's very familiar to me looking at the United States. What we did in New York was tighter than most places in the country. And what do we get when we do that? In the United States for the last uh, uh, two and a half months, we've had about 20,000 people a day infected, give or take 2,000. That's about the right number. That's what happens when you don't close up tight. Now we're opened up and we have 20,000 people a day getting infected. We seem to want to tolerate that. What is our tolerance level? We know some of those are going to die and many of those who don't die are going to be severely injured, wounded for the rest of their life. They're going to have fibrous lungs. They'll have hearts that don't function well. They'll ha have lost their kidneys altogether. Some of them, some of them have brains that have suffered uh, serious ischemic strokes. Uh, we're not counting those people. We count the dead, but we're not counting the wounded. So what is the price we're gonna pay for what we're doing? I don't think we've calculated it. You know, I would say if you looked at just the feeling, this is a zeitgeist. Oh, we're about to reopen, that feels good, let's get out. And then there was the, the big protest. This week, it feels different, at least to me. I see people getting worried again. I hear Tony Fauci saying, hey guys, it ain't over. I see numbers, like you mentioned, going up in Texas, in Utah, some parts of Florida. Uh, yeah, we in New York are now more careful. And once you go through that, you're more careful. I can tell you it's gonna be a long time before New Yorkers are comfortable getting together in groups again. I don't know if that's true for other parts of the country that didn't go went through. I just tell you a personal experience. Yesterday, when I was walking into my apartment building here in Manhattan, they were carrying out a body 
from my own building that somebody had died of COVID. That is a reminder. It ain't over in New York either. So I'm worried about what's happening. And I think I'm the only one that's worried. When you have, you have to remember, today there are about 7 million people we know infected in the world. Six months ago, there was one. Now we have 20,000 of those ones a day. What is gonna happen? I think it's not predictable and any prediction you make doesn't look so good. So you've been outspoken about Moderna and their vaccine development process and the data surrounding that. What are the dangers of what you're calling publication by peer review or well, press release rather than peer review? The analogy I've given is what would you think of a CFO of a major company that said we had great results but never showed you their numbers? You'd not be confident. In fact, it would be a violation of the SEC. What do you think of a company that says we have a great vaccine, but I'm not going to show you my data. I can't show you my data yet for whatever reason that they give. So it's transparency that I'm calling for, but the transparency is a much broader issue. Let's talk about the warp speed vaccine effort. We hear about it. Do we really know what it is? Has anybody laid it out and said, this is how we're planning to do everything? We're just beginning and I'm pretty plugged in. I'm beginning to get some ideas of what we're going to do. And some of those ideas feel somewhat worrisome for me, but I can't tell you because we don't know. Also, transparency of regulation. What will the FDA require for safety? And what will they require for efficacy? Do we know? I don't know. And I don't think anybody in the public knows. That's not right. We're the ones at risk. We should know how our money is being spent. We should know what the plans are in some detail. How many people are gonna be tested? Will they do a challenge study uh, with a live deadly virus? What are their plans? How are they going to judge safety? What are their own internal standards? The government and NIH is helping. These companies are doing it. We need to know, and especially we need to know what the FDA is doing. So the transparency isn't just with Moderna. The transparency is written large. There seems to be a cloak of opacity around this massive effort. And let me just say, the United States and Europe, England in particular, are not the only countries doing this. Who knows what the Russians are doing? We know some things the Chinese are doing because they're publishing it. Who, who knows what the Indians are doing? A lot of people are doing this. If we aren't transparent, why should they be transparent? We as a human species are involved and should know. So we're seeing that the coronavirus seems to be disproportionately affecting communities of color. Um, and we're also learning from, from some of your work in Access Health International that there may be some relationship to blood type. What are you learning now about blood type and the COVID-19? You know, the first thing to know about this disease is everybody is susceptible. There may be a tiny fraction that isn't, we haven't found it yet. Um, I was looking for people who don't have the receptor of the millions of people that have been sequenced, they found two that may not have it. And that's suspect because it could be an error at that level. So it seems to be a requirement. Everybody seems to need that protein to be functional, to be alive. So I think you're going to find everybody's accessible. Uh, is, so everybody can be infected. Then the question is, is, are some people with blood types or this type of genetic background slightly more? Yes, it seems that perhaps a 10% greater chance to be infected. It's a little harder because the type is A and there are more A's than anybody else around. But even with those statistics, it looks like O is slightly less susceptible to infection and, and A is slightly more. But the overriding feature is people of all blood types get sick, get infected, get sick, and die. So it isn't a blanket protection by any means. So that's the uh, first question. The question of um, health dis uh, disparities and why more people of color in the United States are getting infected and why more people are dying. Those two are related, of course. But the simple answer is they have to go to work. They, to live, they have to go to work. Many of them are undocumented. Or if they are not undocumented, they don't have the luxury of 
of, uh, let's say, uh, unemployment insurance or uh, social benefits if they fall unemployed. They've got to work. Some of them are required to work if they want to get back to work, which is all the people involved in the infrastructure of our cities and our life, you know, making sure we have police, making sure the water works, the lights are on. There's a lot of things that people have to do. And most of those people are minorities. And they're minorities that are disadvantaged across the board in health. You know, I don't know who created the term social uh, determinants of health, but it's a very potent term. And you find on average that delivering health care is about 20% of the job and your life and where you live and how you live is 80% of your life's health history. The most startling example I know of is Chicago where you go 20 blocks away, three or four subway stops and you have a 20 year less life expectancy and you're three or four subway stops away from some of the best medical care in the world. So there are many disparities and this virus is just revealing those as disparities, which you know full well exist in your community. They're revealing things that we know, but they're, they're like highlighting it for us. They're shining a sharp light, a bright, sharp bright light on the existing problems we know existed before. I don't think there's, you know, if you're in poor health, which many people are because of their lifestyle, they're more susceptible to dying from this virus. But you can be rich and in poor health and die too. So it's a matter of underlying health rather than race or blood type or anything else. So let's be optimistic and assume that uh, one of these pharmaceutical companies working on a vaccine gets something out and we have a 2020 vaccine that we can mass produce. How do you ethically allocate a vaccine like that? And, and does, the, does the federal government have any role in pricing something like that? How would pricing work? Um, you know, you're getting beyond my, level, my expertise. Uh, that is, those are very interesting questions. Uh, I'm concerned with are we going to get them? If we get them, what are we going to have? Uh, I think there are major questions of equity. People are beginning to think about that, you know, the vaccines that are being made, many of them being manufactured abroad. Some of the major manufacturing facilities are in India. Many of these countries are developing their own vaccines. Uh, but I know from my work in Access, as we all know, that medicines are not equally distributed around the world. Let me just give you an example that I wrote about recently. Egypt, Egypt, the country that we know about, middle income country, uh, recently did it, something remarkable. They screened everybody over the age of uh, 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 12 and over for diabetes, hypertension, hepatitis C, and obesity, the whole country, 65 million people. And they did it in about nine months. Anybody with hepatitis C, viremia, so they did a PCR test on all on the, on, on the 4 million of them, received free treatment that cost the government $34. That's the price. Here it's $80,000. So in a country as diverse and complex as Egypt, you can run these major health programs and solve big health problems. Many people might not realize that Egypt was the center for hepatitis C infection, and it is eliminated today from that country. And everybody is, who is hypertensive has access to free medication. It's an amazing story about what you can do today. So that wasn't a country that had particularly equitable distribution of drugs, but now they're moving in that direction. It can be done. India, you would say that India has got huge social discrepancy and it does, there's no doubt about that. And some populations get a lot better care than others. However, the price of medications there is something that almost everybody can afford. And the Indian government is keeping it that way. Uh, it's a requirement that the price be affordable for most people. And so governments can intervene in very powerful ways. Uh, companies in some cases are cooperating, some cases are forced to cooperate. But uh, it is something that can be done. China also 
is lower its drug prices so that they believe it can be affordable for almost everyone. It's still more complicated than that might sound, but uh, these are things that big countries, the two biggest countries in the world are doing pretty effectively. So are, are there other things that the United States could model off of as we reopen? What have other countries, I've heard you speak about Singapore, um, what have they done well that we could try to emulate as we reopen our economy here? Well, Singapore was doing some things well, but they forgot about their guest workers. And they experienced a tremendous infection rate in their healthcare workers who are just now getting under control. But let me tell you what you need to do. It's, it's obvious to anybody who's been in the healthcare business. It's not rocket scientists. First thing, you need to find the person that's infected and you isolate that person so they can't infect anybody more. And you put them under controlled isolation. And if they're sick, you put them in a controlled space where they're not gonna infect many people. Second thing you do is you contact trace. You go back 10 or two weeks, however long you have to go, and you find everybody and you do that rigorously. We have talked about that, but then most people don't talk about the next step. Once you've found somebody exposed, whether they're testing positive or negative, you do mandatory controlled isolation in a facility where they're all by themselves, not at home, like Chris Cuomo with his family, at alone in a hotel room because they were exposed, not because they tested positive. If you do that, you can drive the infection rate and you have a strict stay at home order. You can drive the infection rate even in a city like Wuhan down to zero. For the last week or so, they've been zero infections in that city that had uh, over a thousand people a day at one point infected. So we know what can be done. This virus is exploiting not just our immune systems, it's exploiting our socio-political systems. It's very interesting that viruses adapt, they mutate, and they try to find the best way to solve their problem, which is how to grow. Well, our socio-political systems, as you look around the world, vary enormously. And those where the virus isn't successful, it gets exterminated. And those, let me give an example, like Brazil or Sweden, which would seem to be a country very different from Brazil, seems to be doing the same thing. So there are subtle differences in socio-political makeup, which make a big difference. And I think that isn't something that most healthcare uh, theorists have thought about how a natural organism inter interacts with our political systems. We're seeing a very dramatic example here in the United States. What New York does is in what Texas does, for example. Same country, different region, with a very, very different response based on people's feeling about the way they should live and the way government should live. I think another lesson is that in times of crisis, you need excellent governance. You need leaders who are clear, consistent, believable, truthful, and compassionate. Those are all things you need from leadership. Then you need a public health service that can integrate and function over the entire area that you need to work. What we have done, and you hear it very clearly, it's up to the governors. The governors will say it's up to the city. The city will say it's up to the county. The county will say it's up to the municipalities. The municipalities will say it's up to the individual healthcare providers. Try to get numbers for something as simple as how many people have been hospitalized. Can't do it in the US. How many people are still in the hospital? Can't do it. These are really important things to know. So we don't have a system, a healthcare system. We have fantastic research. And the CDC is basically an intelligence organization. Overseas, maybe it has a functional arm, but not here. It can give advice. It can say, like our intelligence unit say, hey, there's a threat. Better do something about it. It can do a little bit more than that, but it's not a real, really integrated public health service for our nation. That's a mistake. We should fix it. Uh, Caroline, I wonder if I could just interject because there are, there are several people who are uh, asking questions uh, through our uh, chat function. 
Uh, if you have a question, please feel free to uh, send it in and I'll attempt to uh, uh, weave it into the conversation here. But um, uh, th three questions, if I may, um, uh, Bill, that have been asked. Number one, what, what are the prospects for therapies as opposed to vaccines, uh, as in the case of uh, AIDS? Uh, secondly, um, is there any role that uh, uh, vitamin D uh, plays in the equation? Um, and then a third question, which I, I think is sort of a, it's a, in, at one level a naive question, but it's a question that I've heard asked quite often, and that is, well, if we all keep ice, social isolating for long enough, does the vaccine go away or immediately we go out of our homes? Uh, is it just back to square one? Uh, I, th I think I got those three questions. Um, HIV is a disease for which there isn't a vaccine today and there may not be one tomorrow. How do we control it? Well, we give public health measures uh, messages about uh, safe sex, and we have programs for needle exchange. Uh, but now we have drugs that, if you're diagnosed as being infected, uh, give you a good prospect for living most of your life, good long life, as long as you take your drugs. And you're monitored so drug resistance doesn't come up, but we have like 30 or 40 drugs so you can mix and match and pretty much get give people a, a normal lifespan. And we're getting better and better than that. But there's another you, and will we do that for, H, for, for COVID? I think the answer is absolutely yes. I can tell you as somebody who helped design those drug development programs for HIV, found some of the drugs, that we can do that and should have done that for this virus. In fact, some of the very self same drugs that work well against MERS and SARS that we brought right through animal tests, you'll see them entering. For the next three or four months, you're gonna see a whole bunch of conflicting reports of drugs that are really off the shelf that people are putting into people. You're not gonna see much from those, in my opinion. You're gonna get a lot of noise, very little real action. There will be antibodies directed against this monoclonal antibodies, cocktails that are effective cures or for somebody infected, prevent them from getting sick, can speed them getting healthy, and will be very effective in protecting those exposed from being infected, at least for a period of two or three months after infusion. That's on the horizon. There are a whole series of really potent antiviral drugs. I'm not talking about remdesivir, which is called an antiviral drug, even though when you measure it, it doesn't drop the viral load in a human being that you can see. So it's not an antiviral drug. It's something else. So in culture, it's an antiviral drug, not in people infected with uh, COVID that you can measure. And when it has been measured, it hasn't worked. There will be really effective antiviral drugs that target the protease, helicases, polymerases. We will have those drugs. They will stop people who are infected from falling ill. They will speed the recovery of those who have fallen ill. And they can be used prophylactically in healthy people. Now, there the challenge, the bar is a little higher because your safety profile has to be better if somebody's already healthy. But if the chance that they're going to get infected is really high, you're going to give them those drugs anyway. Uh, and so I think, we're, I don't think, I am certain we're going to have that. So what we're going to have, even if we never have a vaccine, is a way to protect people who are exposed. Let's say the healthcare workers, or you're a family member and you've exposed everybody in your family. Well, then the drug will be used to treat every one of those. So it stops infection or if they get infected, they'll never get sick. And by extension, to all those who've been in contact. All of a sudden, if we have those, which we will, I would say, I can't give you a, a time, but I think it's not all that long. We'll be able to get people flocking to us for the drug who've been exposed. Right now, nobody wants to be identified as a contact, especially if they think they're gonna be put in an isolated hotel room for two weeks. But once there's a drug that says, hey, you've been exposed, we can save you from getting sick and dying, there's gonna be a different reaction. And we saw that with HIV AIDS. Before there was a drug, nobody wanted to get tested. Once there was a drug, a lot of people were happy to be tested. 
And so there are drugs that can be used for curative purposes and prophylactic purposes. And very often the same drugs do both. As I say, the risk profile for the prophylactic drugs has to be better than for the therapeutic drugs. But we will solve that problem. I'm sure of that. Vaccines, we're gonna get vaccines, which I think will be partially protective for parts of the population for some period of time. That's the first question. Second question, role of vitamin D. Um, I wouldn't bet on it. And uh, there are a lot of things that you're gonna hear about. Uh, and that always happens at this phase of a epidemic where people are really anxious. And there are a lot of people hawking A, B, C, and D. Will it have any effect? Might make you a little bit healthier, but all these people, you, you know, there's now articles that FDA is going to try to crack down, but they'll never be able to crack down all the people that say, I can boost your immune system. I'm going to show you how, you know, you stand on one leg for one hour and you're going to be healthy. Yeah. It's, it's always going to happen and you can't shut it down. Is vitamin D that wacky? I don't know, but it's not going to be a cure-all if you can tell you for sure. There's a, uh, there's a question uh, about cross-corona immunities. Um, the notion uh, coming out of Europe that between 40 and 70% of us were already immune because of these cross-corona immunities, particularly those of us who had uh, ch have children in the household. Um, if you're not immune from reinfection from the self-same coronavirus that gives you a cold, why on earth do you think you'd be immune from a different coronavirus? I think that's not out of the question that some people may have residual antibodies to conserve regions that are conserved across the coronaviruses, but I wouldn't count on that to protect very many people. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking for a reason why some people get sick and others don't when they're infected, or some people who are exposed are infected and others not, that may be a small factor if you've been recently infected with a cold. I don't think from first principles, it's likely to be a robust factor. Okay. Um, in addition to uh, the head of the uh, Sylvester Cancer Center, Steve Nimer, who's on the call, and uh, Cindy Munro, our Dean of Nursing, uh, we also have a special guest from uh, the West Coast, uh, Stanford uh, Professor Carlos Bustamante, uh, is joining us, um, and uh, many of us will remember Carlos was here at the University of Miami as a presidential distinguished uh, scholar a couple of years ago. Uh, Carlos, do you have a question that you would like to ask uh, Bill? Thank you, Dean Quelch. It's a privilege and a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, I'm curious about your thoughts on how uh, COVID changes in the short and the long term how we go about delivering care and doing research. One of the things that I've um, observed is uh, we are all hands on deck and I'm sure UM is the same way. The research that's undergoing, uh, that's going on at the medical school must be COVID research. How do we do a better job in organizing those data and making them available to accelerate cures? And long-term, how do we maybe shift to more telemedicine and other ways of delivering care to, to improve um, uh, outcomes and, and to really deliver perhaps a primary care. I'd love your thoughts. Well, uh, Carlos, thanks for those questions. And, you know, in the middle of this, there's some very bright spots. One of the bright spots is how, our, how the world's medical system, the world's caregivers are responding. And I can tell you, when you look at the speed of which the knowledge Let's take a very specific example. When people first came in, they thought it was a lung disease. All of a sudden, you're seeing all these clots. Well, the solution, treat people, some people, with anticoagulants. It makes an enormous difference. Everybody's being treated appropriately, I think, hopefully, with anticoagulants. It's saving a lot of lives. Proning. Some people said, okay, I'm going to put people on their stomach. And they're doing better. Guess what? Everybody's getting prone now. This is good news. This is what should happen. And we're, we're sending those messages around at lightning speed. Also, there's some things that aren't so good. People are saying, hey, well, maybe uh, 
hydroxychloroquine works. Everybody tries that. They're discovering it doesn't work so well. But on the other hand, there's a report out of Hong Kong that there's a cocktail that does work and people haven't paid attention to it, at least that I can tell. So it's not uniform and there's some distortions, but it's a heck of a lot better. That's good news. On the scientific front, I have never seen such a flood of exciting new work visible before review. I mean, a journal used never to let you even think about doing that. You can't even talk about your paper before we've accepted it. Now it's there to see. That fantastic. And it's from all over the world. Let's, I just wrote a little uh, essay on this uh, variant virus. Okay? This is a good example. There's a variant that seems to be spreading throughout Europe faster than anything else. And a computer scientist who's trained on looking at AIDS variants and understands how to decipher what it meant, said, look, it looks like this virus has been mutated to become more transmissible. A pushback. No, that's a founder effect. It got in there first, right? How do you resolve that? Well, well, first of all, how did they make that discovery? Something like 30,000 sequences are in a common data bank. 30,000 from around the world that'll let you see in real time what's happening. That's amazing. Couldn't have happened before. Secondly, then the biochemists get a hold of it, and now it turns out, sure enough, this, this makes a real difference to how infected, it's 10 times more infectable if it's got this single mutation. Virus is changing, it's adapting. I don't necessarily think it's killing you faster, but it's great for the virus, it can get around more. Those are the kinds of scientific collaborations that are fantastic. On the other hand, there's lack of transparency on what we're doing for vaccine development, what the regulators are going to approve or not approve. We need to be a lot more transparent. At the other end of that, for example, do we know what the FDA's requirements will be for approval of a COVID vaccine? What are the safety parameters and what are the efficacy parameters? I think you're gonna find them distorted almost beyond recognition. You can't do a year study. You can't do it in six months. So a 2020 COVID vaccine isn't going to have a known safety profile. It cannot. No matter how many people, you're still not going to have the long term. And can you really do it for a vaccine you're going to give to 2 billion people where one in 100,000 side effects is going to show up in a nasty way and maybe undermine all the good efforts we've made to give people confidence in vaccines? We've got to be careful here. And the fact that the head of NIH or the head of uh, whatever you name it is going to say it's safe. I don't know that. You don't know that. What are they doing? Transparency is important. And the same thing is true with transparency and public announcements for corporations. If you're going to announce you've got something that works, please show us the data so that it can, it can sustain critical analysis by knowledgeable people, not some unsubstantiated press release. You know, John knows if a corporate CFO said something like, I have had a great quarter and doesn't show you the numbers, nobody would believe him and he'd be in big trouble. Well, that's what's happening today. You're getting CEOs, not CFOs, CF, CEOs saying, oh, we have great results. Sorry, you can't see them. We're and, going to uh, have trials anyway. That's not good. And so and, there and, a lot of positives and some negatives. And, and profiting handsomely on the uh, press release as well. Um, President Frank, I wonder if uh, I might turn to you for a minute. Uh, perhaps you have a, a question or a comment uh, to make uh, here. Well, I, I've been fascinated. I, I, Bill um, sends me a lot of what he's been publishing, which I, as I said at the, at the introduction, is, uh, is truly um, a, 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 an amazing um, pressure trove of, of insights as we have heard today. So I, I have just found this conversation uh, uh, truly, truly fascinating. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you, 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 had, you made a very interesting point about the adaptability to different political realities. But there's the question of, of of, uh, of how those political realities also shape human behavior. What's your best guess in terms of, as, as we reopen, 
uh, the economy based on what, what we're observing, this, this variation, almost natural experiment, about uh, what we can expect in terms of the dual <clears throat> purpose of you know, protecting people's health and reactivating the economy. How, how are those going to interact? And uh, is the solution a technology, like a, a, the, the sort of, uh, of drug you were talking about, even, even if we don't have a vaccine? Or, or what's the other set of interventions that we might have uh, to persuade people to, to, you know, do the standard stuff that everyone is talking about, wearing face masks, uh, keeping distance. H how do how do you uh, bring that part of the uh, puzzle into into your thinking? It's uh, Julio, you're asking really interesting questions that are real time experiences for many people. Um, Part of, I think, the way each first thing to realize is that collective action is a result of individual actions. Each person makes their own decision, and that leads to some collective response. And the personal decision is going to be based on what they believe in general, what they believe specifically, and on experience. My experience of seeing a body pulled out of my own building yesterday is one person's. A guy on a horse ranch in Wyoming is gonna have a very different personal experience. And is gonna behave differently because of that. And probably has very different belief sets from my set. And so that's gonna affect collective responses. I think our country is so complicated, we're not gonna have a single response. I think if we suffer, if we're not lucky enough to have a good vaccine and the drugs don't come along quickly enough, I think the country will really suffer enough to begin to get a collective sense of what we have to do. But we may never get there. Certainly with polio that happened. As a kid, there was a collective sense throughout the whole country that we were at risk. I was on a military base in the middle of the Mojave Desert. And my experience wasn't too different from a play kid playing stickball in Harlem. It was the same kind of experience because we had years of experience of polio coming back and back and back. So that can happen to societies, but it takes a long time. And I hope we never have to get there. I hope that we do get vaccines, we do get drugs and our health. But at this point, we're reaching for a solution that doesn't exist. We're, we're taking a chance. We're taking a chance on not, not changing our behavior really significantly or at least really significantly for a short period of time. So we've driven this down to zero, like a number of countries have done. We are going about our business with 20,000 people a day for the last two and a half months being infected, that we count. That's how we decided to do things. Now, what the consequence is gonna be could be pretty disastrous. And you're hearing people begin to get worried about that again. But Julio, I have a question for you. You were the Mexican Minister of Health. What do you think is happening south of our border? Uh, I, I think what you're seeing is the, that variation in, in, in regimes, uh, and it's, it's really not a good response. My observation, and this is totally speculative, is um, that there, there are two patterns that, that stand out to me when you look at the effectiveness of political leadership. The countries that have done best, you have an over-representation of women as presidents or prime ministers. You know, Taiwan, New Zealand, which is you know, now the latest, Norway, uh, Denmark, Germany. Uh, the countries that have done worse have populist men as their leaders. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, and I'm hoping, and again, it's, it, I'm not talking about a cause and effect relationship. I'm just yeah. saying that there are mindsets that converge into that differential political reaction. It yeah. is in the mindset of populist leaders to distrust science, to not like uh, to minimize uh, expertise, technical mm -hmm. expertise. And this is what we've seen. It goes all the way from Russia to Turkey to Italy. Mm -hmm. Great Britain is not a populist government, but they have a populist prime minister. It's here in the States, it's in Mexico, it's in Brazil. 
and and it's a consistent pattern of yeah. disregarding the value of science as the key ingredient for policy making and um, somehow women get it better. I hope one of the effects of this oh. pandemic is <laughs> that's the idea that maybe we, you're right, Julio. But every, every good political leader. Every leaders. time I think of women leaders, I think of Margaret Thatcher. I think of Catherine the Great. Uh, I think of some women leaders who weren't so pleasant. Uh, Indira Gandhi. I can think of women leaders that are no different from men. So it may be that, but I think you're right in the sense that uh, political leadership makes a big difference. And then there's a chicken and egg. Is it the underlying population that gets you those leaders? Or is it the leader that's making the difference? If I may, uh, uh, Bill, uh, uh, here. We, we, have, we have one woman leader who's really exceptional. Uh, we have actually many at the, U, at the University of Miami, but the Dean of Nursing, uh, Cindy Monroe, uh, asks uh, a question uh, as follows. Um, you know, which is related to, to what you were just uh, speculating about, and that is European countries with strong public health systems and universal health care, uh, England, Spain, Italy, and France, for example, uh, still couldn't control COVID, it seems, any better than uh, systems that are not uh, like ours, a universal health care system. So uh, how would you respond to, uh, to that? I would say the difference in control of this, this infection is not controlled by the healthcare system. This infection is cared for by the healthcare system. The control is a matter of individual behavior. And as I look at many of the countries you mentioned, the one country that performs poorly is Great Britain. All the others, after a really terrible experience, shut themselves down and are driving the infection to very low rates. That's, a, that's a, the reaction of a lot of people following instructions and driving it down. Britain looks a lot like the US. Yeah. Uh, it's only partially controlled and the people are only partially behaving. Some people are, some aren't. And uh, maybe it's the, our British heritage. Who knows what it is? But well, every 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 uh, every good European would always say that the British only partially behave. Uh, <laughs> let, let me let me ask uh, let me ask Caroline uh, if she would like to pose a, a final question before we conclude the hour. I'd like to ask a question for President Frank um, for President on his behalf. So you mentioned earlier the importance of a strong leader, and President Frank has been fearlessly leading our healthcare system through this enormous change. Uh, do you have tips or advice on, on how will healthcare delivery change in the, in the coming months? Well, that was an uh, 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 earlier question that I didn't pick up on. Um, yes, it is. One of the things that I've been working on and writing about when I studied the NYU Langone medical system, and Julio knows because he was kind enough to write a, uh, a blurb for uh, my book, is the focus on the importance that technology allows you to distribute healthcare to outpatients, to communities, and even to homes. And you link that through telemedicine. That's a big trend, and it's one that if you have the right information system, can give you very high quality health that's convenient, safe, and cost effective. It, it can make really make a big difference to all of those features that we need for healthcare. On the other hand, what this epidemic shows is the need for sent big hospitals capable of dealing with complex cases that have flex capability. Now, I would say that there's, a, there's an answer there, that the other thing that's happened in this epidemic is so many people have forgotten healthcare. They just haven't got it. I myself am an oncology survivor. I had a head and neck cancer. I've missed my appointments for the last six months because they're not available. I'm not alone. People with heart disease, kidney disease, a lot of the excess deaths we're seeing aren't COVID, they're lack of medical care. You go across the board, we're not providing medical. There's a way to do this, have the hospitals take care of the acute COVID patients, but really have built an existing outpatient service, which COVID patients don't go to on the whole. 
So there is a way to do it, okay? But it's not there. So I'd say the answer is pretty complicated. It's yes, build a distributed healthcare center, which you have at the center, a, a tertiary or a multi-specialist academic center that has big flex capability. One that is like that is Rush. Rush actually was built to handle bioterrorism. Every unit can be converted instantly. And even the lobby can be converted to a uh, isolation ward. It's an amazing place. So yes, build these facilities, but at the same time, make sure that if there's a crisis going on, you don't neglect the health of your population, which by and large, we and everybody else has done. Uh, it's very bad for health and it's terrible for the economics of the healthcare system. Okay, you look at the holes in the budget of the healthcare systems now, they're enormous. You know, some of them are over a hundred million dollars a month in the hole, in the red, it's not good. And that's because people just aren't going to get their checkups. They're not going for their healthcare. They're dying because they're not getting the care they need. So that's a, that's a, 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 a part of it. Telehealth is the answer that most people want to hear. That isn't the only answer, okay? It's a lot bigger question than telehealth. Well, th thank you so much for uh, an enormous number of insights packed into the last uh, 60 minutes. Uh, appreciate very much on behalf of the University of Miami you joining us. I want to thank President Frank and uh, uh, Professor Bustamante for also being with us, Steve Nimer, Cindy Monroe, and thanks uh, again to Caroline Mortensen, uh, uh, one of our outstanding uh, professors in our health management and policy area, uh, for also joining me uh, for the fireside chat. Uh, thanks for all you're doing, Bill, and good luck. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank Zhang Fan for making sure this all worked. <laughs> That's right. Our IT director has done a great job, as always. Uh, good night from Miami. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.